this. <laughs> um, so thanks for joining us today. We really appreciate it for this business and breakfast. So um, the library is currently open for limited services. So um, if you need to get a new book, uh, if you need to make a copy, you can come on in and we can help you with that at the branch that you have um, that you normally use. We don't have books traveling between branches quite yet, but we're getting there. Um, and as always, just a shout out to the partners for Business and Breakfast. Business and Breakfast is um, created in partnership and just couldn't happen without these partnerships. It's the Garfield County Libraries, as well as the Post Independent, the Glenwood Springs Chamber, Blizzard Press, CMC. And even though we don't have um, breakfast for you, um, River, Bren River Blend Coffee House um, is always really great to us. And hopefully we will be able to meet in person soon and you can enjoy that uh, their treats soon. So I'm just going to hand this over now to Josh from Garfield County Public Health. Um, Josh, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me today. Um, wanted to um, get got invited uh, to give an update uh, for folks who were on the previous um, messaging. We we're a couple months, uh, or a month or so ago, I think, um, lots of changes. As everybody knows, um, moving through this uh, pandemic and moving from a stay at home order to the safer at home order and uh, the second phase of that um, public health order, as well as the county uh, applying for a variance. I know there's been some confusion, uh, people referring it to as a waiver. Um, so just to clarify, the title of it is a variance, and it's a variance from the current public health order 20-28, which has is the safer at home order from uh, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. And that has is continued to be in place, amended as it's gone forward. Um, but I would like to just this morning go through as briefly as possible uh, the document to um, which is our local public health order that brings in and references the state public health order but also adds the language of our variants um, that's been approved locally. Um, so there are several different numbers that are in play when it comes to um, activities that can be conducted um, in the community safely underneath the orders and our variants. So I'm, I'm going to try to attempt to have a little bit of discussion on and clarify where those numbers are currently at under our current order and variance. And then also at the end of it, discuss um, what the state is working on to in the next phase um, for this later this week. So I'm going to pull up my screen and share that document. Give me just a second. Minimize here, okay. So our local public health order, are you able to see that okay? Yes. Okay, thank you, sorry. Um, so we, we put in place a local public health order that um, because we've, before the, the governor put into place an order, uh, Garfield County actually moved forward to put in its own order because of the gap 
between what was happening in Eagle County with um, active cases as well as Pitkin County with due to international travel and so we decided to implement and put our own orders in place um, and then I think a few days later to a week the governor had put into place the stay-at-home order. So as we move to this from the stay-at-home order to the safer at home order um, from that point Garfield County has um, chosen to adopt the state's order and use it um, versus and then what we applied for was a variance and uh, the variance is so to have certain categories that we would operate uh, to be more lenient than the current state order that's in place. So this is the order format and it is available on our website uh, for folks who want to take a look at it. But the main categories of the variance that's been approved currently for Garfield County is in the area of restaurants, uh, places of worship, fitness facilities and gyms, um, recreation, which is outdoor recreation and outfitters is how we uh, classified it. Working on the variance, we worked with uh, several other counties uh, that were also applying for variances, similar, um, either similar population sizes or case rates, as well as um, economic activities that mirrored what um, we have in Garfield County to try to, to get that expedited and also to work through the best case scenario. Oops, sorry. <laughs> the um, so I'm just going to scroll down um, to look at the variance categories and go through those. And so that would is going to be my main goal through this to um, get on the same page with what the variance language uh, includes. So I'm gonna start with restaurants. And if you look at the order under section two, um, business requirements, the that has a section that um, includes business types that they've defined as a state that are still to remain um, closed for activity in some manner or the other. And restaurants used to be underneath there. It was restaurants, coffee shops, um, those other places of what they termed public accommodation. So we applied for a variance to open those uh, for on-premises consumption. So if you remember or might be aware that through the stay at home order, the restaurants were able to operate as a critical business for food uh, delivery, but they could only operate for takeout, um, curbside, and delivery services. So no indoor or outdoor um, seating for dine-in or what they termed as on-premises consumption of food and beverage. So that also extended to um, bars, uh, taverns, brew pubs, breweries and things. And so that category with the bars and taverns and things, it's still under the no on-premises consumption. They can do delivery or uh, um, takeout and things, but we're focusing on the restaurants at this time and what we applied to get open during this phase for on-premises consumption. So restaurants are still encouraged to do business through the takeout delivery and curbside pickup and that because the main thing under the safer at home order is the recommendation is still to stay at home if you're able to um, that's the preference and so that is still the mandated preference under the rule uh, the order and um, is encouraged for folks who can still that don't have to get out and to limit interactions as much as possible um, to continue to 
limit the spread of the disease. And so the, which is mainly right now, um, as they've gotten more science on it, really the main mode of transmission uh, we're seeing is person to person contact. And so that being the case, you know, the restaurants are still encouraged if they can, if they're doing good with takeout delivery and curbside pickup and can maintain that, they don't have to open. But the ones who do want to try to, then this is how they approach it through the variants, as well as there's more language within the state order and guidance that has to be put into place uh, for maintaining the social distancing parameters. So there, the, the way that it was drafted was to look at the occupancy of the restaurant and that the baseline being the social distancing parameters that have to be into play to start with, and that's keeping tables um, and parties at least six feet apart. So most of the table guidance is eight to 10 feet and keeping the table separated because if they're in close proximity, as well as if uh, people are walking past, that has to maintain the six foot separation. And so creating those corridors for a safe passage, say to the restroom, to where it's six feet on each side with the person, um, as well as um, that leading up to, if possible, with maintaining the social distancing parameters, the 50% of posted occupancy code um, it would be the maximum. Now, when we put it to the, when we put in our variance, we actually put in 50% up to 50 people, um, both indoor and out. And then the state came back and said, you know, with our variance in the middle and the parameters that we've put in place that people will be following, um, businesses will be following as well as customers, that they increase that to a maximum of not to exceed 175 people. So very few, we, you know, that would be a large venue, a uh, restaurant, restaurant that would be um, able to do that. What numbers we've seen in our business social distancing plan, most of the numbers coming back with the square footage is that most people, most restaurants have uh, in the community is more towards the 30 to 50 person range um, of what they're able to meet the social distancing guidelines and um, look at seating and capacity. So kind of how it's figured is looking at their total square footage of the, the seatable area and then a 28 square foot um, per person um, calculation and getting to what um, is possible within that space and then further limited by having to keep the tables and chairs and things separate as well as people, staff and employees and uh, customers following those six foot guidelines and um, so you'll see that most places uh, you know should be following that they don't allow customers to wait in the lobby areas or form lines um, as well as they should be implementing a reservation system um, and um, as well as we I've seen some places that are having you know we're looking at having people wait in their cars um, if there is a, a lot of folks waiting um, you should see markings on the floor um, trying looking at six foot separation um, and helping to maintain that and um, so there should be, uh, most places have a restroom and things, but looking at sanitizer or even some folks are having uh, hand washing stations that are available for customers to wash their hands or sanitize when they come into the building. Uh, there should be signs posted at the entrances regarding face coverings, uh, as well as throughout the facility, reminding customers of the social distancing and hygiene principles that are in place for hand washing and <clears throat> hand sanitizing on a regular basis. And there is a requirement that uh, 
customers will wear face coverings in order to enter the business and then keep them in place until they've reached their table. Because a lot of these situations, there will be um, a tighter spaces that need to have the, if, if it's less than the six foot or can't be maintained, then the face coverings are um, required as well as uh, face coverings required for the employees in those situations um, and, and all the situations for restaurants. Um, you know, for the vulnerable populations, we've heard a lot of discussion around, which is defined in the order, folks who have chronic lung uh, issues or um, underlying chronic illnesses um, over 65 and um, where we're seeing the most impact from uh, the disease as far as um, hospitalization and, and, and death, then um, those populations are still recommended to um, stay at home, um, are still under a stay at home for vulnerable populations. But we're asking it through the variants too that if places can make reasonable accommodations for uh, getting food or services to vulnerable populations that have some type of uh, separation of hours or times that they um, have for um, those people in this in the in the vulnerable, vulnerable population category. Um, so it's trying to prevent the mixing of um, that with just regular customer um, scenarios. Uh, when you come in, they should be asking you if you're experiencing any systems symptoms of COVID-19, um, and if if anybody is do this questionnaire, they're to not allow them to enter the premises if they are um we submitted for parties group parties to be limited to six members uh, from a single household um, with the variants there has some language that looked at that came out from the state looking at a number of eight but so the six to member of single household is how we submitted our variants and got approval for the numbers that came back for how uh, our restaurants are to be operating uh, during this phase um, the bars seating should be closed um, and remain closed at the restaurants. Uh, they can use the bar and serve drinks uh, as staff, uh, but there shouldn't. If the bar is being used to prep drinks, and um, it should not be having seating at the bar at this time. So th there may be seats at the bar that you see. I know I've been out and look and some folks are don't have a place to put those chairs so they're still there but should not be being used during this time um there should be an an attempt to look at one-way entry and exit looking at how folks are routed through so they're not coming into close contact or breaking that six feet barrier as they're coming in or out of the restaurant um, and uh, attempting to keep that in place. The, you should see the physical distancing practices. There should be an obvious reduction in seating uh, that you see. Uh, so it should be obvious uh, to look at the six foot distancing and how the tables in, have been reduced or the seating has been reduced to um, put that into place. Um, as well as uh, the service stations um, looking at being closed and no self-service items uh, so buffets are still closed uh, during this phase now they can be utilized by the staff but it would have to be plated and served by the staff and not a uh, general customers going up to the buffet or self-service line so um, anything that was self-service should be uh, um, through the employee um, to service to the table. And this really gets down to, you know, that table service as being um, an important part of it. The staff should be all wearing uh, face masks at all times as they are not able to maintain that six foot distancing, close contacts, bringing food to the table, as well as they're mandated to wear masks in the kitchen or areas where they can't maintain six foot distancing um, in those working conditions. And um, there should be regular environmental cleaning disinfection. Um, 
at least every two hours. I know some plans that we've got, if, if it's a smaller facility, they may be cleaning the restrooms or high touch services after every interaction. And it should be maintaining a cleaning log um, that would that shows how they're approaching uh, the disinfection and cleaning protocols. Um, the rule, the order requires that they, if wearing um, gloves and proper uh, personal protective equipment when handling dishes and um, between that interaction of customers. And so staff should be regularly washing their hands as well as sanitizing their hands um, between customers as well. So the, the monitoring of employees that they have to do, they're supposed to do on a daily basis before they start their shifts, is they're monitoring for the COVID-19 symptoms, which I'll go over briefly again, are cough, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, uh, as well as fever, chills, or muscle pain, repeated shaking with chills, headaches, sore throat, and a newer one on the list um, is loss of taste or smell. And we have recently had um, positive cases that um, the main, they don't, I don't believe they had a fever uh, looking at the epidemiology of it. They did have a uh, cough, uh, dry cough, and um, ended up uh, losing their uh, sense of smell. And so that is what we've seen even in local cases is, um, a symptom that has came up and identified that we are seeing um, locally. So, it, you know, it can vary. A lot of these um, symptoms also mirror, like a lot of um, the diseases do, viruses do, they mimic flu and, and the common cold and things. And so there has been some expansion of testing and that you may have seen in the community that if you have had these symptoms, or have these symptoms, um, as well as have had them in the past, that they can they receive some testing to get that clarified. So, again, the brief section of the variance is kind of areas where we're reinforcing um, how we're operating with the public health order from 20-28 as amended, but it it's not all encompassing either as far as there are a, it kind of, um, in my opinion, summarizes a few of these sections. The main point is the on-premises consumption of food and beverage that can occur indoor, outdoor, as well as um, if they have the space outdoor that is appropriate. And then the, um, the public health order itself has many layers that the businesses have to meet for how they're operating. So it's, just wanted to go over these variances and highlight that piece. So do you wanna take questions on that piece or you wanna keep going and then we'll take questions at the end? Um, let's, you know what, let's go ahead and take some questions and then we'll take a quick break so we can switch translators um, and keep going. So does anyone have any questions? Um, about what Josh just went over, um, specific to restaurants. You can put them in the chat or you can throw them in the Q&A. Um, both buttons should be at the bottom or the, the side of your screen. And so we'll give you a moment to type out any questions you may have. One thing too, um, I'll say real quick while we're waiting on questions is they, we've asked and required that businesses that are open, um, reopening, maintaining being open, submit a what's called, what is being called a business social distancing plan. They can file that online. Uh, it's been a pretty good process. I, I think I've gotten probably close to between 700, around 750 probably at this point, um, at least 700 that um, I'm continually going through and reviewing. We're reviewing the plans and if, so they submit them, they should get a 
copy of the plan. That plan ha needs to be available at the front of the entry of the establishment for a review if a customer wants to look at the plan um, and see how they're operating um, and comparing that as well as they should have a certificate um, that they can print out that is to be posted at the entry of the business as well that says that they registered their social distancing plan as, as required and um, so those should be available for customers. All right, well, I'm not seeing any questions. Um, and okay. we'll have a question and answer session at the end too, of course. Um, All right. Um, so I did forget to mention that this um, session is being recorded. There'll be an English and a Spanish version up on the library's YouTube page. And um, this is my first time trying to do the simultaneous um, translation. So please bear with me. <laughs> We're going to attempt to um, switch translators. Um, just to give um, Itzel a break. Um, and so let's see here. All right, Teresa, does it allow you to join any chance? Um, where do I join? Can, can I be heard? Um, actually, I can do this on the inside here. Have you as interpreter too? <laughs> that was my dog, <laughs> Luna. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for um, your patience with us as we go through this. Um, so, Teresa, does it give you the option? All right, I think so, because now I'm not hearing you on the English channel, so I think that worked. Okay, so with that, thank you for your your patience as well, Josh. Um, I really appreciate you guys having the um, interpretation services. We, get, we have a lot of requests for uh, Spanish speaking services as well as uh, um, with our percentage of population. Uh, being uh, close to 40 percent and and as well as in the restaurant community and the service industry um, we strive to have our documents available in Spanish and I just throw that in there I really appreciate it awesome. okay well I think we are all set if you want to continue Thanks. okay yeah so what I was talking about in the public health order 20-28 is there's an appendix I which also applies to restaurants that would go along with our current local order invariances. And there will be a few differences within the language, but most of it uh, expands on the details of what the a business needs to be doing for operations, excuse me, for indoor and outdoor seating. And so looking at the six feet separation parameters, business social distancing, um, as well as the employees, um, what they should be wear, doing for um, face coverings of their covering the nose and mouth, 
uh, at all times, as well as their usage of gloves um, and how they're approaching their cleaning and dis uh, disinfection. Um, and so this actually, we got our variants um, over uh, the weekend, uh, a couple uh, last week, the week before, and so, and then the state um, changed their order to allow for in-service um, on the 27th. And so that's why you'll see this um, being similar as what we were approaching with the variants. And that's with what we we're all working on behind the scenes is developing the guidance and the operations. So you'll see that in the public health state order, it's 50% indoor occupancy with no more than 50 people total, where our local variance allows that to be a larger population if the um, restaurant has the capacity and ability to meet those social distancing and go above that. Um, so I just want to point out that there is this section of the uh, state public health order that is in play um, as well as what's in our variants that folks need to reference uh, for, for guidance. So I'll go back to the next section I wanna look at real quick is places of worship. And so we've submitted a variance to open for uh, our places of worship uh, as they're being titled, uh, which includes um, to have them to be able to reestablish uh, on-premises uh, indoor services to have folks there in person. Uh, it's still um, recommended that as well as supported that if they're able to maintain um, variations in service like the most have been with either uh, remote uh, online uh, services like Zoom or GoToMeeting and um, to maintain that if possible, but if they want to look at reestablishing their um, indoor, they can follow with this variance. So uh, similar to the restaurants, we put in initially for 50% occupancy or with social distancing or up to 50 people, the state came back and approved that 50% um, with social occupancy code limit with social distancing being the main baseline driver of what you can do to get folks in there and how many um, the state came back and said that they can raise our to 175 uh, if the space allows for that social distancing to be allowed and that 175 being 50 percent of the posted occupancy code so similar language with this one on that um, similar language looking at not having folks waiting in the lobby um, not having social or mingling time uh, before, during, or after the services. So really folks are just there for the service, for the sermon and um, the worship service. And the same way with the restaurants, they're in there to dine um, and then in and out for that scenario. Same thing here, the social aspects are what is really still being heavily limited um, those interactions in, in large group settings. So um, looking at masks being required for all the guests uh, when it's possible for their health to be able to maintain that. Um, there are some exemptions in there. Folks aren't able to have for health reasons, but if that's the case, then they have to uh, strive to meet the social distancing even more as we know that um, that transmission from talking and small droplet transmission, talking, breathing, singing is a big one um, that they have seen some uh, choir practices and other settings where it's um, enhanced the transmission of the virus. So those all have to be taken into consideration on how people are spaced and how they're following the social distancing guidelines. Uh, similar to the restaurants, the posting of the signage is important to help folks with uh, reminding of the looking at the face covering guidance, as well as uh, posting signage on the hygiene, social distancing parameters. Um, again, if, if there are vulnerable populations that are being served, then those are 
looked at for online maintaining those, uh, keeping those folks uh, with that category out of the general mix of uh, the parishioners uh, or the folks who are coming to worship services. One-on-one um, -on -one services are still, um, and we're under the state home order for cases where um, service worship services and, and religious services need to be conducted. Uh, between a pastor and an individual, uh, maintaining those social distancing parameters. So home visits and things are still allowed with the, keeping those social distancing parameters in place. Um, so the, it's still discouraging the vulnerable populations from not attending this, the in-person services. Um, it's same with the restaurants section is if they should be screened at the before entering the certain building and if they're experiencing any illnesses be prevented from um, entering the facility uh, as well as looking at the one way you know the directional parameters of keeping folks uh, from being passing within six feet um, is important and it, we're asking that they place markers and marking on the floor if there is a situation where a queue or some scenario is there to help people maintain that six foot or understand what that distance looks like. Um, and so groups from the same household can be within that six foot distance of each other. They're already living together and it's the parameters around that, but then maintaining any of those groups uh, separate from each other with the, the social distancing parameters. Let's see here. Again, they're looking at implementing a touchless offering if, if a communion type situation is part of the services. Um, looking at not plastering around offering plates, um, staff using gloves if they're handling cash and those things as well as regular hand washing and hand sanitization and um, limiting those high touch areas as well as the regular cleaning and sanitation of high touch areas. Um, and if there are communal situations, uh, then having those prepackaged or a grab and go type situation. Um, no self service of refreshments. And so, really, really focusing on getting these worship services open first for the purposes of people being able to practice their religion. Um, and that's the main point, not the social aspects that mm -hmm. it's same with the restaurants or these others that are the main uh, drivers of transmission. So you'll see that being a theme. Um, so no self-service re refreshments um, being the case as well in this. There are places of worship are to monitor their employees in a similar fashion as the restaurants and other businesses that are open um, during this phase. And that is for the same uh, COVID-19 symptoms. So that's a brief overview of the places of worship. And I believe in the current public health order at the state level, Whereas they added the restaurants on the 27th, I don't believe that they added the places of worship. And um, so that's looking at our variance from that, that allows that to be open since um, last uh, weekend, the weekend before last. And, um, and so we have several that are submitting business plans and looking for reestablishing on-site services. So uh, the next is the fitness facilities and gyms. And so underneath the public health order, the definition of gyms um, is where they put um, the, everything that's kind of in an indoor exercising or fitness, um, dance group, uh, exercising, studio centers, recreation centers, as well as bowling alleys indoor pools and other indoor athletic facilities. So rec centers, um, I know we've got a plan from the Battlement Rec Center um, looking to reestablish services as well as some of our private uh, ones like Lakota and um, 
around the around the valley. So this would allow for that. Uh, we have a similar situation to where we put in for the 50% occupancy code. Um, the state came back and gave the cap of 50% occupancy code up to 175 if a space uh, is large enough to allow for that and has, and that would be, I, in my mind, most would come into play maybe with a rec center like Battlement <clears throat> Mesa or a larger one that has many different types of facilities within one um, uh, res building unit. Um, so same parameters as the house of worship and the restaurants don't allow people to wait, um, limit the, any of that scenario uh, to reduce the mingling and um, the close interactions, wearing face coverings when using the facility as much as possible, where it is physically possible. Obviously, we know that if you're in the water, um, say in an indoor pool situation that is uh, limited, then not having a mask is appropriate versus the time that you're on the deck or outside of that or when you're coming to your car into the facility to go to your workout space, um, maintaining those face coverings to limit that uh, airborne scenario. As well as same kind of scenario, looking at the signs, posting of the signs that go along, same with the restaurants in the warehouses of worship. Um, Again, the vulnerable populations highlighted that um, maintaining those uh, stay home. Um, if there are situations where they have um, need services in this area, that they be se separated and that be special accommodations made for that to keep them isolated or, or removed from the general population. Um, same thing with experiencing illnesses, if they should be checking. Um, asking folks if they're experiencing any illnesses and then keeping those including folks who express that they are or show visible signs of illnesses and that with COVID-19 they're excluding them from the facility utilizing the facilities one way and exit directional walkways keeping folks six feet apart as they're passing and, and working through the scenario the ten in this section, looking at spreading out folks, uh, ten foot social distancing, looking at um, activities that increase respiration, and so that guidance pushes it out from six feet to ten feet in those scenarios, um, and so that's something that should be uh, you should see being considered and implemented if you're utilizing these <coughs> facilities. And um, there should be an employee that is required to disinfect equipment after every use and not a self disinfection type scenario where the person cleans it. It should be an employee that's designated with proper PPE, gloves and face coverings that is doing the disinfecting between if there's any usage of equipment involved or an area where the activity occurred of exercise that needs to be cleaned and disinfected due to sweating and other bodily fluids that may be present after that. And so that should be something you see. It shouldn't be a self uh, clean type scenario. There shouldn't be any shared uh, towels or those types of scenarios either. Um, and so the high touch scenario of have maintaining a log and a, and a cleaning cycle uh, on a schedule is there too as well as the same um, symptoms check that is occurring not all, both for the individuals the customers but also the employees and staff employees should be wearing a non-medical face covering or medical if it's required over the nose and mouth um, and if you cannot wear if they cannot wear it, then the employee should be removed to a situation where they're not um, working with uh, customers or in, an, in a manner that uh, they could still work in an office type of environment, say if they're by themselves or not in a close proximity to other staff or customers, that they need to be removed from a situation where there would be close contact if they express a medical need to not um, be able to wear a face covering. And so just because uh, there is an exemption for 
an employee to um, claim that um, they have a medical condition that would prevent them from wearing a uh, face covering, um, that doesn't mean that they are exempt and continue to work in the close proximity to other staff or um, customers. It means that they would be recognized by the facility or the business and then removed from that scenario to perform other tasks or work that don't require them to be in close proximity um, to other staff or customers. The personal training scenario is still limited to four people um, with one instructor. Um, ideally, if they're from the same household as well as, so there are some limitations if it's a one-on-one -on -one type of personal service versus a large uh, exercise area where the person is going and exercising on their own um, or in a scenario like that. A group classes are still not allowed. Um, sports courts um, are still to remain closed. Besides, a couple of exemptions to that are uh, tennis courts, uh, golf courses, and um, as, and, as well as um, the intent is if someone is one on doing it by themselves or doing um, conditioning or something like that, that's different from really limiting team type sports or close contact team sports is the purpose. Locker rooms uh, remain closed. Now that means that the lockers are to remain closed. We understand that if it's a pool situation or there's showers and being able to change clothes, that that still remains in case, but uh, using shared lockers is currently to remain closed. Um, and that will probably be uh, the state guidance I'm seeing coming in later this week that uh, keeps that type scenario shared uh, lockers. Um, closed down so as well as on-site child care facilities are not to be utilized at this time uh, for gyms or recreation facilities so real we'll see the recreation how they've outlined it is looking at outdoor scenario um, and exemption from uh, what is currently under the public health order still closed we submitted to uh, be able for municipalities or there is to be able to open some parks um, scenarios. Now the green spaces and trails and things have been open um, and and act, and promoted to be utilized for exercise during the stay at home. But the <clears throat> what we're looking at here is we look for a group size uh, to go up to 50 people. Potentially, that's with social distancing. Um, that can be utilizing a park or park area, maintaining six foot distancing, wearing face coverings. Um, but looking at bumping that up from where it was in the state order at 10. So the park facilities that are what they consider conducive to gathering um, include picnic shelters, um, picnic areas and playgrounds, uh, those are still closed under the current state order, but in our variance, we asked that they could be opened up and they gave us approval for, <clears throat> uh, for folks, for the parks and recs places that want to try to get some of those open. Social distancing is still the underlying thing with six foot distancing. Um, league or pickup sports are still prohibited at this time. Um, Trails, green spaces, tennis courts, and golf courts may be open for use. Tennis courts um, utilized by uh, either singles type situation or doubles if it's people from the same household. Is some of that background guidance on that. Golf courses are open with some restrictions, um, maintaining what they have to do with if there's any shared um, carts and things, and their sanitation protocols are in place, as well as limiting uh, folks. Um, to uh, maintain those social distancing parameters um, if, if so the guidance looking at six feet separation for uh, physical distancing in the outdoor setting uh, kind of also plays into the same as the gyms and if you're uh, running or biking that increasing so as respiration increases due to exercise then the social distancing uh, guidelines also increase uh, above six feet. I know from 10 to 15, depending on uh, heavy breathing type scenarios. 
so it's really goes back to that just maintaining that separations that are appropriate um the if there's any employees that are involved in these types of scenarios they following the same protocol as the other variance sections wearing non medical face coverings um as well as um, we put in there that there would be some type of cleaning and disinfection protocol that would be put into place by the um, controller of the park uh, or playground or picnic table scenario that is involved and that there would be a log maintained on that so there should be a um, some type of monitoring and oversight that is going along with it and that ties into how the uh, social distancing parameters are monitored as well as um, how high touch surfaces are uh, regularly cleaned and disinfected. Same scenario that they're monitoring for the COVID symptoms and employees as well as if any um, one becomes uh, ill while utilizing the facility. So we did conclude in a section looking at outfitters and that being a kind of separate from what was defined in the public health order to look at these businesses that are specialized in like rafting, uh, skydiving, paragliding, um, hot air ballooning, angling, horseback riding, zip line, and Jeep ATV tours. You kind of get the gist of some of these uh, this category. Uh, we also have, um, you know, like I say, the angling, fly fishing, and um, anyone that is um, performing some of these personal services that are um, in an outdoor setting around an activity. Same guidelines looking at social distancing, um, any of the equipment being cleaned, disinfected between uses, uh, group reservations. Um, reservations should be kept, that way the names and phone numbers, contact information is there in case there is a positive case that comes back that it can be chained back for the contact tracing um, and of who was there at the time, who was utilizing it. And then those folks can be either um, quarantined or look at getting testing in that scenario. So that's the same with these all these variance categories, uh, restaurants, and to um, look at the reservation systems in this scenario as very important for contact tracing capabilities. Um, same scenario, not having customers wait in the lobby, not having lines form. Uh, making digital, in this case, waivers. Uh, a lot of these businesses have waivers people have to sign if they maintain digital, uh, limiting the contact for that. Um, customers looking at the same requirements of face coverings. Um, posted signing should be there. You should be the same thing if you have, if these businesses have an entrance point, they should have the signage that the others are required to have. Uh, what well, that is, the social distancing plan and uh, that they've registered their plan as well as what folks need to be doing to meet the social distancing guidelines. In this scenario, uh, if there is a building involved, uh, looking at 50% occupancy, as long as the social distancing can be followed, the um, transportation scenario should be limited to 30% of capacity. Um, working to maintain the social distancing parameters within the transport vehicles, uh, staff and customers should be wearing face coverings in that um, scenario. Um, Jeep tour skydiving zip line guide, looking at keeping that to members of the same household, not having mixed um, groups. Uh, rafting trip shall allow for trip that can have up to six uh, individuals of a mixed group or a single household. Um, so there's some parameters around how rafting needs to be approached. Um, all equipment, helmets, life jackets, looking at sanitizing those um, and allowing them to air dry completely between usages, um, any high touched areas, seats and handrails clean between groups. So really it goes back to that cleaning and sanitizing between any activities um, before there are any reusage of equipment. Um, we're at, put in to have additional time involved um, for check-ins and checkouts, so their groups aren't overlapping and mingling and breaking those social distancing parameters in that process. 
Again, high touch services looking at maintaining a, a cleaning cycle as well as a log to go along with that. And um, again, the employees wearing the non medical face coverings um, and removing them from activities of close proximity if they aren't able to do that. Um, again, looking at monitoring for the symptoms before shifts um, that they need to be maintaining logs on um, for the COVID 19 um, symptoms as well as any um, customers um, that are coming for activities being monitored and excluded if there's anyone who is showing signs or symptoms or expressing that they have had signs and symptoms um, being excluded from those um, activities. So that's quickly going through um, the variant sections. I wanted to just highlight that we have and been put in place with our uh, current variants. And um, one, th one that we did put in a variance for that um, we were not given approval from the state on is the large, um, how it was classified as large tourist attractions. So the hot spring, the Glenwood Hot Springs, um, Glenwood Adventure Park, um, Hanging Lake Trail, the um, Iron Mountain Hot Springs were put into a separate section um, labeled as large tourist attractions and those were not approved um, a couple of weeks ago through with our variants and so we have recently at the beginning of uh, after we um, got that uh, back the county did resubmit those for to see what gaps and how we could approach them to possibly get them open. Um, part of the scenario around those activities that we know are an issue with the state is travel is still limited. Um, tourist, uh, tourism is the heaviest impact. It was also how the virus was brought into um, surrounding counties uh, as well in the, in the beginning phase that we've seen. So I see probably still seeing that that being um, restricted moving forward. And then, um, but we're, we're pushing with the state to see if we can get even in limited numbers of that. How we put in for the variance for those activities was around 30% of their normal occupancy. And um, they, they have very robust plans that they've put together as organizations and businesses. And we feel confident that um, with their oversight that they have and the number of employees and how they maintain those practices of social distancing that they put in their plan that um, we're hoping that we can successfully get a variance through in those areas and they can start to get employees back on uh, uh, working uh, in some capacity as well as uh, some uh, customers in the door. So, um, like I say, there is the underlying public health order 20 28 at the state level that's in play and a lot of details about how businesses need to function underneath that are more um, detailed in that order and should be referenced uh, along with these variances if there's any questions. Um, we are working currently with looking at state guidance um, towards June 3rd that is outdoor pools and outdoor um, some activities that we've been approved in our variants but the state is also moving towards um, having in their public health order for opening up and um, I would as well as some of the uh, really quick caveat on the restaurants and the bars and breweries and things. So one thing they did put into the order at the state is if, is it really around food service? So say like a brew pub um, is it functions where it has meals, plated meals and meal service are able to be open under the restaurant uh, kind of section um, with this phase. Same way with some breweries that are um, still closed as a category on there unless they have meal service. So there are some that are working with close proximity restaurants to 
have plated service or food service in that facility that doesn't provide it directly. And so there are some relationships that can be formed and worked through to have some of these business categories um, opened up under with the current order. And so we're working with those two um, for the ones that want to, to see how we can get them open under the current um, order. So thank you. Um, I know that was a quick run through. There's uh, so much <laughs> documentation on this, but uh, uh, hopefully uh, helps clarify some of the, where we're at on the variants and the order at this time. And I have to take any questions. Awesome. So we actually have a few questions. I'm going to really quickly um, switch the interpreter again, just so we can give Teresa a bit of a break. Let's see here. Okay, um, it's, it's all yours. All right, so we have two questions here for you, Josh. Um, the first is, what is the group event gathering number for outside? So the way that the local order is worded is it's 25 for any for public and private gatherings. And that would be inside or outside. Um, activities that would be an outdoor recreation type scenario. Um, say I, we have one um, group that is looking at just getting together in a park six feet apart and doing some calisthenics, getting some fresh air, um, and that, you know, with the outdoor activities, it's towards 50 uh, for those specific um, categorized activities. If it's just a meeting or a gathering or something um, that is separate from those activities, then it would be uh, the 25 currently. So uh, theoretically, if the social distancing parameters were met and you could maintain separations and face coverings and looking at six foot separation um, for a meeting um, that could be conducted in person. Okay, great. Um, next question, youth ball sports have not been approved by Garfield County variances, correct? Correct. We are currently working um, with the um, several different partners along with the state um, towards what can be done in those scenarios, if at all. And so that is being continually looked at in the background and we're working with our partners to see if there are different levels of those activities that could be put into place and allowed. Um, but right now, the scenario is that it's um, still closed. Will Garfield County be submitting another variance in the future? Yes, and so we, as I mentioned, we did resubmit uh, for the section that was um, denied in this first one. We're also currently working and discussing um, for the next variant submittal. And um, so I know this week, um, as well as even at the end of last week, discussing with county uh, management and um, directors to look at what our next submittal is going to be. So yes, we're working on that. Any more questions? Uh, when will the next variance be submitted? I don't have an exact date um, in front of me right yet. Um, I do know that we're working on it. it may be submitted this week. It may um, maybe at the beginning of next week, but um, here in the short time frame, we're looking at um, getting another variance in that would be um, you know, the part of the scenario, I'll back up just a little bit, is when, since it is a phased approach, as 
we're working under a CDC guidance as well as um, in this new environment of really as the science is, is coming into play and being developed as we're moving through this, then it still kind of falls back to that two week time period of evaluation. And so along with our variants, we have been given a, a, a condition that if our caseload rises to, I think it's 60 and within a two week time period, um, that we could possibly go back to being restricting um, the businesses that were open under the variants, um, even all the way potentially back to stay at home um, type scenario if caseloads uh, increased high enough uh, during that time period. So it's really, really evaluating a staged approach as saying, okay, we got this variance, we, it came into play on this date. We had these businesses types um, open for these activities and then evaluating those over that two week time period. And so, you know, when we look at changing that or moving to the next phase, that kind of timeline, it comes into play. So if we're not seeing an increase in case counts or disease transmission due to in these scenarios that were opened up, then we'll put in to open a little bit more. So we're working on that variance or you know that scenario in the background leading into that next phase and along those timelines that um, so um, so I think that's a good point to put out there I also would like to all say that one thing we're asking people as we open these businesses or the businesses open back up as we've put it out there is we're it it doesn't apply to say, yes, restaurants can open in this scenario of 50% uh, up to that in an indoor setting and up to 175. Um, but then we get questions about, well, I have this type of activity that's similar. Why can't I um, open up to that level with that number of people, say in an event hall or a, um, another scenario? And so we have to be clear that we're trying to get the stage open and it's specific to that category and how it's defined in the order that we're allowed, or they've allowed us to open that type of facility. And then we monitor that activity and that is, has close proximity and those parameters that are more higher risk transmission. And then if we're, and then we'll put it in for the others as we start to expand. So, those those categories that are still closed, like movie theaters, event halls, and um, venues, music halls, performance theaters, and then staging it out in those next phases. So it is it is complicated and can be confusing as one section is allowed to open and have activities that and another is still limited to say a general group of 25 versus you know a, a one could be up to 175 and so we appreciate that and um it, it it just asks that we all work together to get through these phases and hopefully are able to then open the next phase and we're asking too that one as we open these like places of worship gyms and breakfast facilities, restaurants, that really be taken seriously because um, if you have uh, someone who visits that facility and is positive and then comes into contact with staff as well as the people that are also in that facility, then they're looking at a 14 day potential quarantine type scenario. So your staff could be all put, you know, you know, removed from the scenario of with a quarantine so that business could be restricted and not be able to remain open just for the staff fact of not being that the staff are now under a, a, a quarantine type scenario. So I think it's important to understand that, um, you know, being opening these scenarios and doing this, that we're being cautious and we're we're working through as best we can to maintain the social distancing and the face covering guidelines and 
um, because it could easily be hugely impactful as we've seen in some other areas that um, a business is then closed down basically because the quarantine is implemented for the staff as well as then all the folks who were there at the time have to be contacted and then tested or quarantined for that time period. So it's um, that can be hugely impactful as well as publicly facing and, and um, so it's a huge, huge piece of it is that now we move from stay at home, which to the safer home and beyond is then the contact tracing and quarantine orders and isolation orders on individuals becomes more into play versus a blanket type scenario. And so just, I always try to highlight that in discussions is now as we move into this phase, it also moves into these direct isolation quarantine orders that are focused on individuals and their contacts. And that may be traced back to a business activity that has expanded and opened to these scenarios. Um, okay. Um, so where are we in the current phase and when should Garfield County enter the next phase? So what we're looking at on our roadmap, um, which is available on our website, garfield-county.com. Garfield and if you go to that website, at the top are some red um, buttons that, that um, take you to some links that are the safer at home, as well as the roadmap. And so we've broken that out into a couple different phases. We're considering this to be phase two of that roadmap. And that is where the language of the 25 group size um, that we had in there comes into play, even though we've gotten variances for these other activities and group sizes to increase. So that baseline stays in that category phase two. And then um, that being, look, how we've drafted that out is looking at a four week type scenario. As a, as a starting point. And then how we're approaching it though, is to look at the disease transmission cycle of two weeks and that kind of 14 days um, and cutting it down further if we can. And that's why we're kind of moving or trying to move some of this at a two week type scenario versus a four week type scenario. And so, if we move into the next phase, um, it would be um, in that two to four week type scenario. So we're coming up um, looking at towards the two week um, and then we'll hopefully be able to get some data analysis on transmission and, and positive cases. And then um, we will put in to uh, move to the next phase. So I'd say here the anywhere from two to uh, four weeks in that type time frame. Um, so what is the time frame, frame that an, a business, in this case an office, needs to operate under the plan that was filed with your office? Um, currently, um, until the, so the, the current business plan that is filed will if you're continuing to maintain the same activities, then you theoretically wouldn't have to file a new plan to change into as the orders change. When the orders change, it would be as we change phases. And that we're trying, that's why we also have a local order, order that goes along with it. And so theoretically, if say the restaurants as a, an example, move or are able to move in in next phase from 50 percent to say 75 percent or, or some scenario uh, this is just an example uh, of um, not a concrete thing that we're looking at but uh, then at that time that the business activity changes then we would ask that the business social distancing plan be updated and so it's a scenario of looking at the order changes, how it affects, if the order changes affect that business category, 
And then if the business moves in a direction to increase activity or change activity um, due to those changing orders. All right, well, I think that's it in terms of questions. Um, Josh, thank you so much for coming back um, to um, tell us more about um, the recent changes and, and we really appreciate it. Well, I really appreciate you um, having me uh, involved uh, to do this and you know, any follow-ups that come in um, afterwards, um, please don't hesitate to forward those on and we can try to get you a response and through your channels and um it's it's really it's pretty dry material and so <laughs> i appreciate um folks uh participating and uh, working through it and um so we'll just keep moving forward and we really appreciate all of our partners and the public that have been um, cooperative through this process and have been um, partners in this public health, uh, you know, scenario and working through it with us. And um, we don't, you know, it, it, as we've moved through it and the changes are constant and ever, you know, it seems like three, every three days we've get new stuff and, and we appreciate the impact of that uh, on ourselves as well as uh, the people in the community and um, it really gets down to the individual responsibility and approach that has to be maintained that we are working to protect each other as well as ourselves and our friends and family and um, hopefully we're moving forward and out of this as we continue to um, work to get some of these different business categories and economics reestablished. And um, just want to say that we really thank the community for the support that we have received. And we do, the majority of it is very supportive of, of what, it, what we're working on here. And, and um, but we, again, we also just say thank you back to the community as um, working with us through this, so. Nicely said. <laughs> thank you. Um, just a reminder to everyone, this is all being recorded, um, so there will be both a Spanish and an English version um, on the library YouTube page. Um, just go to gcpld.org and um, scroll to the bottom to find that. If you um, want to ask a question of Josh, you're welcome to email me. I can forward them on. You'll find my information if you just um, look for the locations um, on our page. Um, you'll see a uh, uh, my information, my contact information on that page. So just give me a call or an email and I'll make sure that Josh gets those. And with that, um, thank you so much, Josh. And thank you, um, thank you to our interpreters, Teresa and um, Itzel. And everyone, I hope you have a great day. Thanks.